Our next workshop is called The Unique Diversity of the Life in the Little Tennessee Watershed. And I've already introduced Bill, but I will do it again because there are some people who weren't here before. Uh, Dr. William O. McClarney has directed the Upper Little Tennessee River Watershed Stream Biomonitoring Program currently through Mainspring since 1989. His emphasis is on bridging the gap between experts and the general public to build consciousness of aquatic biodiversity and what we can all do to protect it. Jason Matter is Aquatics Program Manager for Mainspring Conservation Trust. Jason is involved in engaging youth and adults in stream education and serves as the project manager for restoration activities in the Little Tennessee and Hiawassee River basins. So, do you want to say anything about the uh, film before it starts? Yeah, or, yeah. Are you whichever one of you? Yeah, I do. Uh, we're going to start this segment with a short film clip, and it's one of several that are going to be shown today, and with one exception, right? They're all from uh, an organization called Freshwaters Illustrated, which is a very small organization um, based in Oregon, which is probably the world's premier company in terms of doing uh, uh, film and video uh, based on freshwater conservation issues. Uh, we're working with them through the Native Fish Conservation Area, um, and I've also had the privilege of working with them in Costa Rica. They're super generous, and they have provided these absolutely marvelous film clips which are going to completely upstage anything we can say. Uh, they also have a longer film. Jennifer, did you get it running? It was playing before the film Yeah, but is, is it out there? No. no. It was in here. Huh? We played it three or four times in here. On the okay, board. but it's not out there. No. Okay. Well, the, uh, the, the appetizer that you saw as you were coming in was one of their films, and we'd be glad to give you more information about them. I had hoped uh, they were going to have a representative here today. Uh, they don't, but I just want to give them a shout out, and they deserve a whole lot of credit. Because they occur in the water, 
reds and blues and yellows and all of these colors I thought only occurred on coral reefs. And then you dip your head in the southeastern rivers and discover that you have these amazing colors here in your backyard. And there's so much just right here that we definitely got to know and learn and celebrate and protect. Just getting in the water in a healthy stream and experiencing it for what it is, is the spectacular reason that drives me to the water whenever I can. I got fish in it when I'm... <laughs> I feel kind of like the theme is aquatic biodiversity, and, but I feel kind of like, you know, when you go to church, you hear the sermon, and then you go eat the fried chicken, and I feel like we just had the feast, and, the feast, and now I'm being asked to preach the sermon. Uh, well, I'm going to try and make it at least modestly interesting. So, okay, aquatic biodiversity, and of course biodiversity in general, because all biodiversity needs water. Uh, terrestrial plants and animals as much so as aquatics. Um, so we saw, well let's start with the definition of, of, of biodiversity. It's one of those big words, but it's, it's susceptible to a very simple definition. You can get more technical, but for purposes of this gathering, let's say that biodiversity is talking about the totality of all the species of plants and animals. Uh, be it on the planet or in some particular area that you want to define and, and talk about. Um, best estimate we've got right now uh, for what is probably on this planet is on the order of 8.7 million species. And the majority of those have not yet been formally scientifically described. So we've got just tremendous uh, resource there. In the film you saw a bit of it. All of those are creatures from our part of the world, aquatic creatures. Um, almost all vertebrates, animals with backbone, fish, a big hellbender, salamander. Um, I guess there was some mussels in there too. But I want to talk just a little bit about perhaps the less known aspect of aquatic biodiversity uh, in our area. Well, I just went to the movie again. Why did that happen? Okay, what is biodiversity? Yes, all right. Uh, some of the benthic macroinvertebrates um, in our watershed. Now that's that's more fancy words. Benthic means they live on the bottom or in the bottom among the rocks and the sand and what have you in the bottom of the stream. Uh, invertebrates, they don't have backgrounds and macro means they're big enough to see with your naked eye. So this is just a little sampler on these. Uh, just to talk about some of them a bit, over here on the right, you've got Chironomid midge larvae, sometimes called blood worms, though they're not really worms. Um, and you will notice, in this light I don't notice it so much, but they're flaming bright red, just like your blood, and that's really what they are. These little animals are almost pure hemoglobin. I mean, hemoglobin is the substance in your blood, or in a fish's blood that enables us to extract oxygen from the air or the water, as the case may be, when it passes over your, your lungs or, or your gills, whichever you have. Um, so these guys are really adapted to live in situations where there's not very much oxygen. Um, up here, top, second from the left on the top, you've got a somewhat more familiar animal, which is crayfish. Uh, there are hundreds of species of crayfish in North America. We've got three or maybe four in this watershed, two of which are endemic, uh, which is to say they're not found anywhere else in the world. We've got Camparis georgii in the Little Tennessee upstream of Franklin, uh, and we've got Camparis aspermanus up on the Highlands Plateau. And again, there may be more things to be discovered there. Um, let's see, stonefly down here in the left. This is a larva. A lot of these creatures are larvae 
of critters that are then going to grow wings and, and, and fly away, uh, which is a little appreciated mechanism for getting nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, out of the water and back up on the land because the majority of those critters die on the land. So stoneflies are particularly interesting, uh, among other reasons, as a, an indicator of high quality water. You find a lot of stoneflies, you probably haven't got severe pollution problems. Um, up in the top right there, a caddisfly larva. Caddisflies build houses. I, I could show you 50 pictures of caddisflies and it'd all be interesting. They make their, their little shelters out of leaves, whole leaves, or cutting leaves into strips and weaving them around, or they make them out of sticks, uh, sand, and this particular case is one that builds his house out of little pebbles that he picks up in the stream. First job he's got to do when he gets born, build a house or someone will eat you. Um, that's the, oh, and down here, I'm going to leave the muscle, we're going to have more to say about muscles later, so just let it be known that that's a macroinvertebrate, it's a muscle up there in the upper left hand corner. And then down here, one of my favorites, this is, um, can you hear me okay? I keep turning. Yeah, you need the face wall. Yeah. Um, but I want to look at the picture. I don't know if you can see him down here. Um, it's a Helgramite or a Megaloptron larva or a Dobson fly. It's got a bunch of names. My favorite name is the Spanish name. And in Central America, they call them Gusano tigre, tiger worm. Uh, and they're, t they're pretty tigerish. They'll give you a good nip. They get about this big. Uh, and the adult is even more beautiful. If you can imagine this thing with even bigger jaws and a great big set of wings, it's just lovely. Um, personal opinion. Now, <laughs> if you're not convinced on the theme of beauty, then here's an adult of another one of our aquatics. This is a black damselfly, one of the commonest aquatic species in our streams in this area. So, okay, diversity. We saw a lot of fish in the film. Uh, here in the Little Tennessee watershed, we've got maybe, maybe I could stretch a point and say 50 species of fish that you might actually be able to go out and find. Uh, in terms of benthic macroinvertebrates, the best estimate I can get from Macon County alone is, is over 500. So it's a very little appreciated aspect of biodiversity and they're all down there falling around in the substrate of the stream. The stream isn't just the water. Most of the life in the stream, not the big stuff, but most of the organisms are down there in this rocky, sandy, muddy, whatever it is, uh, substrate. So, extremely important. Now, these animals also have an importance beyond being interesting, and I can cite many importances. Uh, trout fishermen know one of them. They're a pretty important source of fish food. The whole art of fly tying, uh, began with efforts to imitate these, so some of the first trout fishermen were entomologists. Um, even more important, they're processors. You're out on a stream, things are constantly falling into it. Leaves falling off trees, insects falling in, in, in the water, a piece of your sandwich falls in the water, whatever. Uh, and these little guys, along with bacteria, are responsible for breaking that down. If they weren't there, this material would just accumulate and accumulate and you'd see streams full of very slowly rotting leaves and they wouldn't support much life. It would fill up the channel just as surely as sediment does. You'd get alterations in the channel. So they're, they're sanitary engineers, essentially. Um, another importance is as indicators. Every state in the United States and most governments uh, in the developed world maintain a program of monitoring benthic macroinvertebrates as water quality indicators to protect your health. So, bugs well, down in the stream bottom are protecting your health. Um, so, we come to the question, we've just cited a whole lot of species. Are all species equally important? Well, I'll let you decide. Um, but here is one of my personal favorite species, therefore it's important. Um, this is the breeding male of the spotfin chub. Um, it's in breeding colors, this, this blue, this neon blue on the back is very unusual in a freshwater fish. 
And then, actually, I don't know if you can see it, I can see it here. There are vertical white bars on the side which only appear during the actual half an hour or less when the fish is mating. Um, they're totally spectacular fish. And it was my good fortune, and I should add, there's only about six populations of these, give or take, left. Uh, in the United States. They formerly ranged from southwestern Virginia down through western North Carolina, uh, north Georgia, northern Alabama, and back up into Tennessee. Um, and of what we've got left, the strongest population is right here in our little Tennessee River. And I had the great good fortune to study spot pin chub back in 1988 and 89. Uh, and part of my good fortune was to catch the spot pin chub when it was on the rebound. Um, until the 70s, uh, it was sort of presumed to have disappeared from the Little Tennessee River as it had done from so many other rivers. Uh, then TBA biologists found a few, and I had the hubris to apply for a grant to study it, not even knowing if I could find one. And I went out, and all of a sudden, they were all over the place. So that was, that was my great good luck. We don't know what brought the spot pin chub back. Uh, we do know that things like something that Sharon mentioned earlier, preserving great amounts of riparian land along the Little Tennessee water and its tributaries conduces to the welfare of the spot finch up and lots of other species. Uh, but a more important question maybe than just talking about the spot finch up is what would happen if the worst came to pass and the spot finch up finally disappeared? for good. Um, the answer probably not much. I'd miss it. Um, but recreational fishing for smallmouth bass wouldn't be affected. I'd probably be less likely to use a shiny blue lure, but other than that, uh, other things would move in to take up that gap in the food chain. Water quality wouldn't be affected. The aesthetic experience of paddling down the Little Tennessee uh, would be the same. And to speak to that, I want to cite um, an example that was used by the author Paul Ehrlich. Uh, he asks us to imagine, what would you think if you were getting on a commercial airliner and you saw a guy perched out there on the wing or popping rivets out of the fuselage and putting them in a sack? And you might say, hey, what's going on? And he would say, oh, I can get 50 cents a piece for these. And besides, these things are way overbuilt. You know, well, at the level of one rivet, he's certainly right. At what point do we remove too many rivets? And that example applies analogously to the ecosystem, but it's scarier because at least with the airplane, you know how many rivets are there, you know what each one is supposed to do, you know what would be an unacceptable risk. Uh, we don't have the faintest clue, of, well, we have the faintest clue, we don't have that level of knowledge about how the ecosystem is put together and what pieces we can lose uh, before we do serious damage. So my point that I'm building up to here is this. That all species have a right to exist. And I think that's the most powerful argument uh, for protecting biodiversity. You can make other arguments and they're all good. This species is beautiful, that species is interesting, this one is useful. They perform a function in, in, as I cited, for benthic macrovertebrates in processing materials and streams so that the natural processes work and so on. But let's just say that all species have a right to exist. And one of the things I like about saying that is I can say it to darn near anybody. It applies at any level of your belief structure from purely creationist to agnostic evolutionist. It's still true. So, um, I think, if this isn't being too pompous, that a concern for biodiversity, conservation, um, is a measure of our moral worth. So the question is sometimes put, or not the question, but the proposition is sometimes put, you know, that we're going to die, we're going to disappear if we don't take care of this stuff. Probably not true. Um, I want to introduce, I'm going to talk about biodiversity or biomonitoring in a minute, but one of the terms that we use in biomonitoring 
one of the categories that we erect is what's called a tolerant species, which is the ones that survive the most abuse, which are often characteristic of polluted environments. Um, examples, uh, cockroach, kudzu vine, Norway rat. Uh, and another very good example of a tolerant species is Homo sapiens. Um, and we're tolerant by virtue of technology. Up to a point we can compensate for polluted water. We can compensate for polluted air. Uh, we can find new ways to grow our food. We live, we live in houses. We have technology which enables us to, to cure diseases or prevent them. So we're not going away. If we behave badly, what our quality of life will be is another issue. Um, but I think, not to be too dire here, but I think part of the question is do we deserve to survive, not will we survive? Um, well, it's time to lighten up a little here. Uh, I want to uh, explode maybe another misconception when people talk about biodiversity. You know, that more is always better than less. And yes and no. Um, some of you may know I work part of the time in, in Costa Rica. And in Costa Rica, we recently, and Costa Rica is a country that has a big reputation in biodiversity conservation. Well, we recently had a presidential election, and we had one candidate, Fabricio Alvarado, uh, who was something of a Trump type, minus the extreme misogyny and minus all the money, but with all the dumbness. Um, and if you're a presidential candidate in Costa Rica, you are going to be asked questions about biodiversity, just as surely as you're going to be asked questions about the economy and other things that you expect. And Fabricio Alvarado's platform on biodiversity was, well, we can import exotic plants and animals so the tourists will have more to see. <coughs> Excuse me, Don Fabricio, here's the dunce cap, go sit in the corner. We're not talking zoo here, we're talking planet. Um, well, fortunately, as I said, he, he lost, but there is a tendency uh, to look at the places that are more diverse and get excited about them. And, and I'll confess, I have been guilty of exploiting this. I have said in grant proposals, may God forgive me, uh, that the Little Tennessee River was important because we had more species of this and that than, than neighboring watersheds. Uh, well, okay, hopefully, hopefully I'm, I, I, I'm forgiven. Um, so this leads us to talk about uh, biodiversity and biomonitoring. And I like to say, biomonitoring is one of the ways you measure biodiversity beyond just counting species. And I like to say that biomonitoring is the science of what should be. And a big point to make about uh, biomonitoring is it's fun. Uh, these photos are of people right here in this watershed working with Jason and myself and others from Mainspring uh, biomonitoring our streams. It's playing in the mud. It's good fun. Uh, the only thing I would object to about these pictures is that it makes it look a little too much like a, like a youth movement. Uh, we have people of all ages, geezers and geezerettes, out there working <laughs> with us in the streams, and you are all invited. Do we have a sign-up sheet? I think we neglected that. Yeah, well, we should put one. We should, put, we should anybody that wants to have this experience uh, can get in touch with me or with Jason or with the Main Spring office, and we'll try to facilitate your getting involved. It's both fun and educational. Um, so anyway, uh, what we do, one of the things that we do in biomonitoring is calculate something called the index of biotic integrity, uh, which is a fancy way of saying is this stream, or it could be a forest, but in this case this stream, uh, all that it should be. And we do this by counting species and examining them and seeing their proportional abundance uh, given points for uh, species that may be particularly sensitive, that, that might be in danger of disappearing, uh, giving points against 
uh, the tolerant species that I just mentioned, and also for any exotic species that may have been put there by the Fabricio Alvarados of the past. And we come up with, with, with a score. Uh, we come up with an evaluation. Uh, we assign a bio class. Excellent, good, fair, poor, or very poor. According to our comparison of what this ecosystem is and what it should be. Now, how does that relate to biodiversity in terms of species numbers? Well, here is, if we were to go to Needmore, down where the Tennessee River is biggest, uh, we might, with real hard work, come up with 40 species of fish in a day. This isn't one of them. Um, and I'll get back to that in a moment. Why, that, why I say that. This is the brook trout, at least I think it's a brook trout, Salvalina spontanalis. It's a rather distinctive native fish of the southern Appalachians. Uh, it may be more distinct than we know. Um, I think most of you are aware that the southern Appalachians is a little peninsula of northern habitat that kind of juts down into the hot southeast. Uh, has a lot of elements that you don't necessarily associate with the southern states. And this is one of them. Um, when I first came here, I looked at these fish. I, I grew up in New York State, and I fished in Canada, and so on. I know brook trout. And I said, oh, brook trout. And local old-timers said, no, 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 that's a speckled trout, which is what people call them here. That's not the same thing you grew up with. Well, ichthyology said they were wrong. Now, with the advent of modern genetics uh, to, 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 to determine species identity, there's a chance that maybe this is something different. Well, whatever, it's special. Now, if you're going looking for this fish in this area, you're going to want to go up to the Highlands Plateau or maybe the upper part of the LJ watershed, and you'll go into a stream and you'll find these extraordinarily beautiful fish. It's the only fish species you'll find in some cases. Does that mean that need more with 40 species is better? No. What we look for when we go out to buy a monitor is what we think should be there. And if nature wants one species of fish in a place, that is the biodiversity that that place needs. And of course, it's going to have lots of insects and other elements of biodiversity. So I'm coming up on a final point here. Uh, a couple of things I'm not worried about, and one thing I am worried about. I'm not worried that people like you are going to get inspired by this and grab a rod and go up to Highlands or up to the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, get, catch 100 brook trout, put them in the freezer, and come back and wonder why the fishing is no good next year. Uh, I'm not worried that people in this audience are going to go out and shoot a bald eagle for the fun of it. I am a little worried that a lot of us, including those of us who are in practice conservationists and who really think about these things, are not aware enough of the important importance of habitat. And this is particularly important in the aquatic environment because they're all concerned about water pollution. Well, I am too. If I want to get a drink out of my faucet, I don't want polluted water. But I think we tend to underrate the importance of habitat. Habitat is the most important thing. Um, and here are some healthy aquatic habitats. Um, oh, we didn't get the one in there I wanted. Well, all right. Uh, down in the lower left corner, uh, we've got a, um, a beaver pond. I had hoped to show a picture of the state line wet wetland recently protected by Main Spring simply because I haven't been able to squeeze information on wetlands into this talk, but they're terrifically important components of overall biodiversity. And then we see the, the Little Tennessee River, the big picture uh, here at down in Needmore. You won't find very many places in the southeast United States where you can see a river that size that looks like that. And in the upper left, um, we've got the uh, We've got Tessin T. Crick, uh, the owner of that property is here today. Do you wish to remain anonymous or would you like to be identified? He's anonymous. 
Um, anyway, um, this is an individual who has taken great care uh, to protect and enhance his stream. You'll see a very healthy riparian buffer zone, and don't get me started, I can talk for three weeks on that, uh, with lots of vegetation, lots of shade, um, vegetation drooping down into the water, lots of rocks, um, fallen woody debris, which is a positive element. Uh, I don't mean you should go, down, go out and cut down trees and knock them into the stream, but nature wants some branches and logs in the stream. They're important to have it. This is great, healthy habitat. That's what I wish all of our medium-sized streams look like. However, we also have to think about the smallest streams we've got, which sometimes don't fare so well. And I always like to say, to emphasize this point about water quality and habitat, you can take the best water in the world and run it through a PVC pipe and nothing is going to live in it. Uh, well, this is kind of what we're approaching with these shots. On the left, you have Crawford Branch as it goes under the downtown Ingalls parking lot here in Franklin. Next time you go to Ingalls, remember to get from your car to the store, you're crossing a bridge. Uh, completely out of sight and forgotten. This other one is also in Franklin. It's a natural waterway that's been converted to a concrete trough. It doesn't even hold moisture now. Water goes in and evaporates. It's lifeless. These, even if we had good quality water in these types, which we don't, but if we did, uh, we've still got a sterile environment, which isn't producing anything, isn't contributing to biodiversity, and it affects everything downstream from it. Um, so, my point is that we need to protect these kinds of things, and they're the hardest things to protect. Uh, I speak from the standpoint of, of working with a land trust, but they're hard to protect in, in many ways because they're so numerous, they're so hard to notice. You can't build a fundraising campaign around a ditch. Um, and yet, they're the kinds of waterways that more of us have on our properties, and more of us have a chance to do something about than anywhere else. Um, so, in summary, yes, we can achieve uh, biodiversity conservation through intelligent regulation and through obeying regulations, and that's great. Uh, we have the public lands, national forests, national parks, out there preserving great swatches of habitat, and that's great. Uh, we have organizations like uh, Main Spring Conservation Trust, Highlands Cashers Land Trust, and other more activist types of uh, environmental organizations uh, like Mountain True, like Save Our Rivers, uh, and you can support all of these, and that's great. But it's going, it's not going to happen unless each of us shoulders our, our portion of the load. So, um, I wanted to show this, just uh, I, I stuck this in at the last minute, just to say that regulation works. This isn't a species which almost qualifies as aquatic, bald eagle, uh, which wouldn't be here absent the Endangered Species Act. Um, but in conclusion, what I really want to get to um, is taking responsibility uh, and protecting what is yours to protect. And I, I'll finish that with an anecdote. I used to work at a place, it was an experimental farm, and we had visitors days on Saturdays, and people come from all over and ask questions. You never knew who you were going to meet. Let's say I just met a couple from Iowa, hypothetically. And I would say to them, you know, you're really lucky, or maybe you're really challenged, depending on how I felt, being from Iowa, because in terms of biodiversity conservation, that's one of the most important places on Earth. They say, what, what? I mean, that's easy to defend here. It's easy to defend in the Amazon. They say, what, what, Iowa? And I say, because you live there. And I think that's, that's the point that I want to leave you with. I'm going to turn it over to Jason Metter, uh, who's going to talk about one very important group of rivets. Yeah, we're, we're still running in Can, or you can do it after How would you prefer? Take questions. Take questions now? Okay, I'll take questions. Could, could you just say maybe one, two things about wetlands? 
Yeah, yeah, I know. I really wanted to shoehorn them in there, and they just wouldn't fit. Uh, gee, wetlands are so terrifically important, and they are so underrated, uh, particularly here, where superficially they're not prominent components of the landscape, and where they've been altered out of existence. Uh, but since my theme here is biodiversity, there's all kinds of stuff that lives in wetlands uh, that you're not going to find anywhere else. Bog turtles are a famous example. A lot of different kinds of plants, a lot of insects. Uh, and they are also, departing a little from my theme, terrifically important in protecting water quality because they hold water and, and, and filter it and provide clean water to the flowing waterways that we're more likely to notice. Um, we have mostly very small wetlands here. If we were down the coast somewhere, we'd be looking at some really big wetlands. But I think maybe the most important thing about wetlands is to learn to appreciate them aesthetically. Most of us have a kind of a natural aesthetic feeling for a river. We look at it and you know, we go to a waterfall and say, ooh, ooh, ooh. Uh, most of us don't do that when we pass a swamp. Uh, and I really think we need to, I'll, I guess I'll put in another plug for Main Spring, preserving the state line wetland, which is surprised right down on the Georgia state line. Uh, I think that was an extremely important thing to do. Uh, what else can I tell you? So related to that, what, what's your view of the, the uh, prevailing attitude toward beavers around here? Ooh! <laughs> that is such a... Would you like to hold another conference? We, we could schedule it. Uh, beavers are a real interesting question. And I'll start off by saying I'm sympathetic to the person whose property is flooded by a beaver. My word, you know, uh, it's inconvenient. Uh, the most obvious thing to say is they're not an exotic species. They're part of our native biodiversity. They disappeared here. We've got them back now, we should be thankful. The problem there, and I could cite similar problems with other species, to me, is that the beaver is existing in an environment different than the one that the beaver developed in. Um, different because it has to interact with us, but also different because the distribution of forest resources is different. Um, one thing I've noticed on the Little Tennessee River by my house, and it's, it's getting a little better because we're getting healthier riparian zones, I try to imagine if I'm a beaver uh, and I need to cut down a tree uh, and I gotta sit on my butt and chew this thing down, uh, where am I gonna go? I'm gonna go for the tree right on top of the bank where it's nice and flat and I'm gonna take that down. So beavers become an agent of deforestation where we don't want it. Um, they also, another issue is, I show my northernness, uh, New York State, Canada, you're a trout fisherman, you think of beaver ponds as a positive thing, they're great environments, that's where you're going to find a big trout, that's where the trout are maturing. Um, here, because of, I think, temperature differences, and also maybe because, and you, you know more about this than I do, right? Uh, about sediment, uh, accumulation in ponds there. Beaver ponds aren't always really great aquatic habitats. I think we got to figure out, I think we got to sit down with the beaver and figure out how we can live together. And it's, it's more, it more, that's more question than answer, but I, I suspect that's why you threw it at me. And Brent. Well, they're certainly native to the upper Ohio River Valley. They're native to the Little Tennessee. They're, they're more prominent in the French Broad, some of our other rivers. Um, and I don't think we know enough about them to really make a prescription for this watershed. One of the things that I always complain about is that the early ichthyologists never found the Little Tennessee. So I'm, I'm 
handicapped in knowing what is or isn't novel here, compared to even if I worked in the French Broad, let's say. But we do know that in, okay, there are muskies that live in lakes and in sluggish, slow, slow flowing streams, and then there's the Ohio muskie, which is typically found in, in rather fast flowing streams. Uh, we do know that those fish need flooding and they need riparian wetlands to reproduce. And we've had an enormous loss of that habitat in this watershed, which probably corresponds to the decline of the species. I don't know how abundant they ever were here, but I remember when I first moved here, now and then you'd see a picture in the paper of some guy with a muskie he caught in the Little Tennessee, usually right below Lake Emory. Haven't seen those for years. I, in, in 20, da, 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 how many years, 28, 29 years of monitoring, have seen exactly one. Um, so I think we can say that it's a component of our biodiversity and a top predator, which makes it significant, that we've essentially lost here. What relation Lake Emory has to that? I don't know. Uh, how much did Lake Emory affect the flooding regime downstream? I don't know. I really don't know. I'm getting a lot of these great I don't know questions. <laughs> well, maybe we'll let, uh, Jason knows some things. We know some things about mussels. You don't have to defend them just because they exist. They've actually got an important role in the ecosystem, which we can describe, but they're also real interesting. So, Jason. So I'm here to talk about freshwater mussels. Uh, to me, as that's been my most of my education and some of my early career working directly with freshwater mussels, I tend to think of them as I get really excited about it. However, I've been told that they look like rocks, and I'm making it about as interesting as rocks. So if there's any <laughs> geologists here, hike up your tube socks. <laughs> We're going to have a great time. Um, everybody else just. <laughs> Bear with me. Um, so as far as biodiversity, at, at one time, and we believe there were seven species of freshwater mussels here, um, one of which had been extremely rare, the little wing pearly mussel, and a couple of times it had already been presumed extirpated or completely gone from the Little Tennessee. The last time I had seen one was in 2005, and I believe the last time that either 2005 or 2006 was the last time that an individual was found. So for all purposes, it's believed that we've dropped from seven species of mussels to six species. So there goes a ribbit. Um, from then, and, and, and Bill mentioned this once briefly, we had talked earlier about regulation. Um, we talked about the Clean Water Act, but another important piece of regulation was or is the Endangered Species Act. Um, because of that, um, it, it's, it's a blessing and a curse because to get, you know, if you get listed, uh, that means you're in trouble uh, or you have a very small geographic range and you are, are, are at risk of extinction. Um, so it, the idea is try to stay off the list, but if you do get on the list, um, it means that there are more resources and it invokes uh, monitoring. Uh, therefore, through uh, monitoring efforts, which again, it's important, um, they have noticed, biologists have noticed a sharp decline of the Appalachian elk toe, which was your, okay, I just gave it away, was your um, other endangered species of mussel in the Little Tennessee. From that sharp, from that sharp decline, um, over the years, beginning in 2005, uh, from monitoring efforts, biologists started scratching their heads, going like, "Hold up, wait a minute, something's not right." Uh, what well, used to be the hot spot, the the best place in the world to find Appalachian elk toe, uh, is there declining, they're, they're going away. Um, fortunately, uh, again, when I had uh, my early career, I started working as a technician in the, the Piedmont in the eastern part of the state, and I had the, uh, 
an invitation to come up here and, and help assist with some of those muscle surveys and I was kind of wondering like why are these things endangered they're all over the place everyone about um, probably nine of every ten muscles I picked up was an Appalachian elk toe uh, I was more interested and I may have time I've kind of shifted my talk but I may have time to show some uh, video footage of the diversity of uh, uh, the, the wavy ray lamp muscle and their lure display. That's what I was coming here to see. I was like, let's see all these cool lures and, and learn all this cool stuff about muscles. But um, I thought, well, why are these endangered? They're all over the place. Well, since then, and at least within the past two to three years, definitely the last two years, biologists have failed to capture a single live individual of the elk toe. Uh, we still are not entirely sure what has killed them um, but through monitoring, because it has raised a, kind of an, an alert, a, a red flag, uh, there has been research around, um, around that decline. And for some reason or another, we believe that they're, they're starving to death. Uh, is, it, is it bacterial? Is it a fungal uh, problem? Um, is it... Uh, a toxicity issue within the Little Tennessee itself, T Little Tennessee River itself, that causes these muscles to become uh, less immune uh, to some of these other problems. So analogous to HIV or AIDS, um, the muscles may not, that AIDS or HIV doesn't necessarily uh, directly um, uh, kill a person, but it becomes it drops their immune level so that. Uh, the common cold is now life-threatening. So therefore, what we're learning, learning with these muscles is they're slowly starving to death. They're underweight, um, and we believe that they just slowly die off. Uh, with that, there's a, another similar species that's in the same genus uh, as the Appalachian elk toe. It, too, has disappeared. But again, in other parts of the state, in many other states, in other streams, um, if there's no monitoring involved and if there's no resources and funds to continue monitoring, we may have historical records of many different species of mussels, uh, but unless you're monitoring and, and keep it up, what would have happened here if there was not a monitoring program involved for the Appalachian elk toe? possibly 10 or 20 years later, either through state, federal biologists, or even universities coming out, go, uh, coming out here going, huh, there's two more muscles are gone. I had no idea. When did this happen? How did it happen? When all that would, would have been lost? So again, we've gone from seven to now four species that you can find in the Little Tennessee River, or four to five maybe. We'll see if you're lucky, but at least the population has dwindled uh, so low that we may, they're on their way out uh, as of right now. But it, the good news is that for some reason it's only happening in the Little Tennessee River and in the Tuckasegee uh, and, and some of the other watersheds where you find the El Elto, they are not seeing the same fate. They're, they're continuing to thrive and, and hold on. So just a little bit so here's the lure this is what i was initially going to talk about uh the lure of the the wavy red lamp mus muscle which is now the most common muscle species in the little tennessee river um that fish i've uh muscle fish <laughs> i've been working with fish too long muscles have a unique life cycle uh, in that uh, they the females when they have uh, they hold larval mussels, which is in your, if you look at this top picture, it's on the, the, the right hand side, it, it looks like a, a clam with these little hooks on them. Uh, the thing is, there's not a whole lot of soft tissue and a mussel, like clams, have a, uh, a foot, a soft foot, which allowed them, allows them to burrow into the, into the substrate. And, but these glochidia, these larval mussels, do not have that foot. What they require is a unique host species of fish to attach on. So the, this adaptation, adaptation of the wavy ray lamp muscle is, 
it attracts that host fish. It attracts fish by uh, having a lure that the fish will get curious enough and try to nibble on. When it nibbles that, they release those larvae, the larvae attached to their gill, the fish's gills, fins, wh wherever and however it can attach to the fish. The fish swims off and at some point those uh, larvae drop off of the fish. That, they go through a metamorphosis of, from their larval form to a very young muscle. They, when they fall off, they have all their, uh, their anatomy in place. They have that foot, they can burrow into the sediment, and then they grow. So that was kind of the, the cool, cool life cycle about a uh, muscle, but they also require a host fish. So getting back to that interconnection of biodiversity, we have a lot of diversity of muscles, and each one of those require that diversity of fish in this area. Um, that was going to be a, well, that's an error. <laughs> um, okay. So that was just kind of wrapping up. If you have your agenda, there was going to be a 10 minute uh, block for uh, education and, and our, our work with our STEM uh, coordinator in Macon County. And since I was kind of involved with both of those, I just wanted to segue into this talk. So wrapping up with mussels and the, the diversity within the Little Tennessee River here in Macon County, uh, that creates a fantastic opportunity for education and outreach for, for all people. I'm going to highlight uh, mostly uh, youth education outreach, but as Bill mentioned, um, it's, you're never too young to, to learn, and we have education and outreach for adults and kids alike. But this will be highlighting kind of work with, within Macon County with summer groups, 4-H. We work with um, the, the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians and the tribe going with, with outings through the Native Fish Conservation Area and those partners involved with being able to purchase snorkeling equipment. So again, getting folks out there in the water, getting their heads under the water and seeing all this diversity is Students are, are fortunate, they may not realize it at this time, but they're fortunate they have this opportunity, whereas just other places within the state, um, you can't do this in Charlotte, you couldn't do this in, um, in the Piedmont, or not to this extent, and not to see this amount of diversity, and not to learn about what exists in your backyard or in your stream. So I have one video, is the video, thank you, Jennifer. This video is a representation of a new program that we started this spring with Shadow Biologists, and I think it's pretty well covered in the video, but that was the title of it, Shadow Biologists. And we got to work with Jennifer Love, who is the Macon County STEM coordinator. So while he's getting this um, ready, I do just want to thank uh, Bat Clot Cinema, which is a, a group here in Franklin that um, helped us produce this video, um, so I very much appreciate their help with that. Hello, my name is Jason Better. I'm the Aquatics Program Manager for Main Spring Conservation Trust. Main Spring works within a six-county region of Western North Carolina and including the headwaters of Little Tennessee River in Raven County, Georgia. Hello, my name is Jennifer Love, and I'm the STEM coordinator for Macon County Schools. Uh, STEM stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math, but what it really is is problem solving. My name is Mikey. My name is Jordan. I'm in ninth grade. Ninth grade also. My name is Cody Zeppelin. My name is Carly Walker. I'm in ninth grade. I'm also in ninth grade. My name is Maddie, I am in ninth grade and I go to Macon Early College. My name is Victoria, I'm in ninth grade and I go to Macon Early College. Shadow Biologist Program really is uh, trying to show the students from Macon Early College um, what are some of those issues that we have in our community and that there are solutions to these problems. Um, Shadow Biologist is where we are 
going out into the field to look at the quality of the water and to see what things live in and how it's shaped in it. Uh, you learn a lot about being a biologist and you experience a lot of the experiments they do. Um, I wanted to be involved because when I first heard about it, um, I thought it would be interesting and I hadn't chosen my career path yet. Uh, I thought it would be cool to um, assess streams and rivers and I thought it would pretty, look pretty good on a college transcript. <laughs> <laughs> my favorite part of shadow biologist is the fish on collecting data about the fish. My favorite part was being able to go outside and get in the streams. Um, my favorite part is when the fish talking. Yeah, and then my favorite part was when we went out with the net and we actually got to catch a bunch of different insects and just different creatures in the mm -hmm. tree. Biologists need to have a foreknowledge of the area. They need to um, obviously know their field, um, but then be willing to go the extra mile, collect all the data necessary, do it thoroughly. Some common interests for biologists are the interest in fish, bugs, and stuff like that that live in streams. I'm interested for biologists is just to really like the wilderness in general and want to help fix it and learn about things that are going wrong with it. As a biologist, they have to be interested in keeping the water clean and making sure that everything is in order so that it's not making habitats bad. Uh, students may realize that they're very passionate about becoming a biologist or an ecologist, or they may realize that that's not their strong suit and they can select a different path. However, there are so many careers available within the area that directly or indirectly affect the natural resources. So understanding the trade-offs and understanding the balance between economy, natural resources, and development, um, we can all make better informed decisions to coexist with the natural beauty in this area. Uh, the community needs to be aware of the fact that pollution, uh, runoff, and then uh, just trash in the streams is bad. And uh, to pollute the waters and your organisms living in the streams are not going to survive for long. All of our work is volunteer based. Um, we work with landowners on a voluntary basis, whether it's to conserve their land or restore their streams. And so we see this as an opportunity to work with students, which will be your next generation of landowners, to place some sort of a value on the natural resources, the unique beauty that we have in Western North Carolina. The most valuable thing I got out of this experience was learning more about our ecosystem, but I definitely learned that precautions do need to be taken when it comes to fixing the streams. The most valuable thing out of this experience is to see what rivers look like when they're unhealthy and what we can do to restore them. That's why I plan on is I actually got to see what litter and everything does to all the animals and fish in the community. Uh, I think it's important for them to see and learn that the collaboration that they're doing in school, the reason why we focus on the importance of working in a group, really does translate to the workforce. So we want to thank especially uh, Main Spring Conservation Trust uh, for partnering with Macon County Schools and spending so much time uh, working with our students going out to the rivers and streams. Uh, we also appreciate uh, Calvita Hydrologic Lab and U.S. Forest Service who allowed our students to, to look at uh, what is what are some of the Forest Service management practices? Um, and what is the difference when you manage a forest? Um, how does that affect the water quality compared to maybe an urban stream? So we want to thank our partners. Do we have time for questions? Yeah. Right. Any questions? Yes, Gary. There's been a lot of discussion about the top, there's been some discussion about the Little Tennessee, but one of the major branches <coughs> to the Little Tennessee in the region is the Sage. So how are the muscles in the Sage? Well, historically there, um, there, are, there are, we have no records of there being muscles in the Colossasia. Um Speaking of, well, clams and bivalves for that matter, 
and Jason Love is actually going to do a, a similar study on this this summer, uh, we've noticed that there has been an invasion of the Asian clam, uh, which has been uh, you know, progressively getting uh, worse in, in the lower Little Tennessee River, below Lake Emory, but it's now being found above Lake Emory, which uh, there could be some bivalves in the Glossasia, um, but certainly we've noticed it in Partugaget Creek. Um, I believe there have been some studies, again, going into trying to figure out what's causing the die-off. Um, there may have been some studies and there may be ongoing studies or upcoming studies to try and to identify, again, is there a certain tributary uh, that's causing the die-off? Is it coming out of the Colossages? Is it coming out of Cartouge? Is it coming out of the Little Tennessee? I mean, it's certainly a question we should worth asking. Um, I don't know if that study has been done or if it's coming up, but it's certainly been thought of. So Jason, related to that, what is the spatial distribution of these mussels? Are they mainly in the main stem, or how far up, what size stream do they get into? Uh, everything that we know of have been in the main stem or right at a creek mouth to the main stem. So between Fontana to uh, Lake Emory. There are, and we found, especially doing macroinvertebrate samplings, we found fingernail clams, which are, are native uh, and, and even less known about them, and above Lake Emory uh, and in most of our smaller tributaries, but not the, not the native freshwater mussels. I read about commercial harvesting in the past of mussels in the French Broad, vast amounts of uh, to use the shells, I guess, to make mm -hmm. so, were, were mussels ever had numerous in the uh, the species that they typically use for that uh, to make the buttons would have been from the washboard. Can you repeat his question just so everyone can know what he asked? Sure, sure. Um, we'd asked about um, muscle harvest, uh, historical muscle harvest to make buttons and, and for other use. Because they do, similar to, to all many, if not all, bow bows, they have that, uh, they create that mother of pearl. So they have that pearlescent uh, coloration to them. So they make pretty buttons. Um, but historically, those mussels. Uh, were much thicker shelled than any of the mussels that we have in Little Tennessee, and they're also much larger. Uh, they're called one of the most uh, dominant species was uh, the washboard, and it would be literally this large and, and fairly thick, so you could punch out uh, the shell and make those buttons. And again, none of the species that we have within the Little Tennessee would would be conducive for for that. Yes? Has there been any change in the water temperatures of the streams over the years? That may be a good question for Coweta. Um, and, but but we, we certainly have not monitored the, the temperature long term and continuous temperature. We may take temperature on the, the particular date that we're out there. But over time, to see if there's a, a gradual warming or cooling or stable temperature. We don't, we don't have that information. In our reference watersheds, we see a, okay. there's a pretty close correspondence between air temperature and water temperature. And over time, we see it. Could you repeat that? I will. I will. So yes, um, through Coweta Hydrologic Lab, they have measured uh, long-term temperature changes. And they said there is a correlation between air temperature and water temperature. And so there is, they are noticing a warming effect of the water. And then certainly we can uh, expedite that by removing the riparian buffer. So a smaller stream, which would normally be fully shaded, if it no longer has shade, it's receiving that solar radiation you know, throughout the day in the, the heat of the summer. It would be warmer than a, a stream of the same size that would be shaded. Good question. So, uh, larger catfish have been known to eat mussels. Uh, 
certain mammals, muskrat, otter, uh, raccoon, will eat, will eat mussels. Um, certainly once they, you have to have some sort of a, a powerful jaw to, to, to crack them open. Um, but yeah, a lot of your, a lot of your aquatic mammals and, and some fish will eat them. I would, I would add to that that maybe the Asian clam, Corbicula, has taken up some of that slack. I'm not, I'm not advocating for an exotic species, but there's an enormous abundance of Corbicula in some parts of the Little Tennessee, such that if I were an animal that needed to eat that sort of food, I might think, well, okay, I'm going to survive. I don't know. But do humans eat them, and do you find shell bit? If you did, did you use them to figure out what was in the river in the past? Yes, absolutely. Uh, the, uh, the Native Americans, there's a, enough uh, uh, reference that Native Americans did uh, eat them from, from time to time, uh, depending on the location, depending on the region. Uh, some were dependent on them more heavily than others. Uh, because they're a long-lived species, Folks in recent years that have attempted to eat mussels have uh, realized that their the flesh is is very tough. Again, it's a source of protein, but it is extremely uh, tough. Um, and I'm saying this from not necessarily personal experience, but knowing uh, folks that in, in other regions who have attempted to. Uh, to kind of get back to, to, to the roots of level let Native Americans have eaten these and let's, let's try to find a, a way to eat this and then it, it's difficult <laughs> to, to, to make them palatable. It's not the muscles that you n normally get with your, uh, your spaghetti or a, an Italian restaurant. Uh, all, however, the Asian clams, I have eaten corbicula, which is your Asian clam uh, chowder. You have to purge them, but they don't live quite as long. They're not as tough and rubbery, and so they are uh, more comparable to the, the muscles that you get in the, the restaurant. That's a way to get rid of an exotic invasive species. <laughs> All, right. All right, thank you.